You know, there's nothing more exciting than God. There's no more exciting than living for Him. And that's been over almost 40 years for me. And it doesn't get dull and it doesn't get boring. There's always something. If you, if you think Christianity is dull and boring, come on one of my mission trips with me. I'll take you to India or I'll take you to Africa. And you can see how the rest of the world lives. Because we kind of live in a little bubble, you know, and we think, you know, this is how life is everywhere, but it's not. Amen? Praise the Lord. <clears throat> well, I want to I welcome those who are watching by Facebook Live. God bless you. I know Sajeev in India is watching us right now and maybe other parts of the world. I know Maine, where Sister Linda's up there, and she's faithful in watching. And we say, God bless you. We hope today's message speaks to your heart and to your minds. And it actually changes you. Amen? I want to talk about a subject today that I found very, very disturbing. And I see it a lot, and this is something that God's been putting on my heart all week, is religion without God. You know, many people have religion, but they don't have God. You can go to church, you can go to Bibles, you know, you can go to Bible school, you can even go to Bible study, you can go to prayer meetings, you can go to conferences, you can go to all of those things and have a religion but not have God. And I started to think about this, and God started dealing with me in, in some areas of my life and started challenging me in some different things. How many know that nobody arrives? Even the pastor doesn't arrive. God still deals with our hearts and deals with our uh, behavior. And so um, as I was reading this and, and studying this, I saw such a parallel to a lot of what is called the modern-day churches today. And you're going to see that very clearly as we get into the Scripture this morning. Um, so if you have your Bibles, I would like you to open up to the book of Amos, and we're going to talk about religion without God. <clears throat> now, in the book of Amos, chapter 1, in verse 1, it says, The words of Amos, who was among the herdsmen of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. I want you to understand that God uses ordinary people. You may feel like, wow, can God use me? Yeah. Amos was a farmer. He was a herdsman. And he wasn't of the sons of the prophets, nor was he uh, in line to be a prophet. But God called him to be a prophet. He was just a nobody. He was just somebody that wasn't seen, somebody that wasn't heard. And yet God used him in a tremendous way to bring a reproach against Israel and Judah because they were not living for God as a whole. And in chapter 5 is where we're going today. I want to read for a moment a few verses of Scripture. In verse 1 it says, Hear ye the word which I take up against you, even a lamentation, a house, O house of Israel. What is a lamentation? A lamentation is a very strong crying. If you've been to a funeral of someone, and someone has been lamenting and crying, you can hear them. They're wailing, they're, 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 they're sorrowful, they're really in anguish that that person has died, meant a lot to them. And so they really, really are crying out in, in, in grief. And here is Amos saying this to them. Take heed, take up against you, even a lamentation. He's saying, you, you, you guys ought to be really wailing and crying out to God, but you're not. And he says, to virgin of Israel is fall the virgin of Israel is fallen. What is a virgin but someone who uh, looks at themselves as someone who is pure, someone who is virtuous, someone who is uh, untouched, or uh, someone who is clean. And he says, she shall no more rise, she is forsaken upon her land, there is none to raise her up. For thus says the Lord God. Now, when you see that, that's not Amos talking. It's just his voice and his vocal cords. But God is using him 
to speak to the people. How many times do you go to church and do you hear God speaking to you? It's not just somebody standing here giving a sermon or a message and it's just, okay, well, that's great and we all go home. But God is trying to speak something into our hearts and into our lives that is beneficial for you and I. He says, thus says the Lord God, the city that went out by a thousand shall leave a hundred. In other words, you're going to suffer loss. And we're going to get to the reason why Israel is suffering a loss. He says here, and that which by forth a hundred shall leave ten to the house of Israel. And here's verse four. This is the main crux of my message here. Seek. For thus says the Lord unto the house of Israel, Seek ye me, and you shall live. The problem with God's people, or the people that are religious without God, is they come to church, they read their Bibles, they come to Bible study, but they don't seek after God. Can I get one amen at least? Getting me scared over here. I think somebody's going to throw some rocks pretty soon, Joe. Are you listening to me? They don't seek God. They, they're using God. See, they want God's blessings. They want God's prosperity. They want God's gifts. But they don't want God himself. They want all of the things that God has to offer without commitment. That's why God is speaking to the children of Israel. Now understand that, first and foremost, the children of Israel always believed that they were God's chosen. And thinking and believing that they're God's chosen, they believed that God would never forsake them, God would never leave them, God would never abandon them because they're God's chosen people. They're a peculiar people, a holy nation. They were to shine forth the light. They believe that. Isn't that what a lot of the church today believes? Oh, God will never forsake the church. God will never, will never abandon the church. God will never do that to us. We're his chosen people. He said, seek ye me, and you shall live. The problem is that people don't want to seek God, because if they seek God, God's going to give them answers that they may not like. When you seek God, he's going to put his finger on areas of your life that he's saying, okay, enough is enough. You've been controlling that area long enough. Now I want that. See, God doesn't want to be just a little puppet God that you have on a string and you control and you tell him what you want and he is obligated to give it to you. No. God requires... All or nothing. Are you hearing me? He wants all or nothing. He says, seek me. Why? You shall live. People that are not seeking God, hear me now. People that are not seeking God are sinning. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Separation from God. And so what people have a tendency to do is they replace God and a relationship with God with religion. We sang a few songs. 
made our hearts feel good. Get a little stomping, a little clapping, a little, you know, hallelujah. And then we sat down and we heard a tremendous song that was sung. We heard a nice prayer over the offering. Then you hear a nice message to some. And then a little closing prayer, maybe a little altar call, and everybody goes home. And they have a religion without a relationship. I want you to think for one moment. If you had a husband or a wife or someone you cared about that only came to you when they needed something, there are people like that. They'll only call you, they'll only text you, they'll only come visit you when they want something. But they never call just to say hi. They never call just to say, hey, I was thinking about you. No. They only call when they want something. And that's what we do with God. When we're in trouble, we're in distress, something's wrong. Oh, we're right there. Oh, God, where are you? God, come help me. But on the other times, when we're getting blessed, are we still seeking God? Look what he says here now. This is very interesting. I don't know if I'm going to get to all of this. I hope I can. Seek ye me, and you shall live. But look at verse 5. But seek not what? Say it together. Bethel. Don't seek Bethel. Why not? What's that got to do with seeking the Lord? What's that got to do with being close to God? See, the Israelites believed, and for good reason, because Bethel means in Hebrew, house of God. Now I know there's some that might be watching or some that might be sitting there thinking, hmm, God is telling them not to seek going to church. And that's not what he's saying. But some will interpret it that way. Well, see, the Bible, now I have, now I have a reason. I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. No. He said, seek not Bethel because there was something wrong with Bethel. See, if you remember the story back in Genesis, when uh, Abraham had a vision, a dream, and he saw angels ascending and descending. And when he woke up, he said, this is the very place of God. And it says he built an altar, and for the first time in his life, he began to seek after God and what God wanted for his life. And he called that place the house of God, Bethel. And so it had a spiritual meaning. It was a place where man sought God. Jesus even takes it into the New Testament and he says, You have made my father's house a den of thieves, but my father's house shall be called a house of, what is prayer? Seeking God. Today, churches have so many programs. They have so many things going on. They've they got so many different avenues that you can go into when you go into a church. And you don't just come to church just to sing and clap and stand and, and greet one another in fellowship. That's all great. That's all good. But your main purpose here is to come and seek God. It's not about talking about sports. It's not about talking about all these other things that are, you can do that later. Your first priority is coming to seek God. When we first started the church over in the other place, we had intercessory prayer from 9 to 10. And then it went from 9.15 to 10. And then it went from 9.30 to 10. Then it went from 9.45 to 10. Not because I changed it. Nobody was coming. 
And so there was one person here today at 9.35 to pray. Why is that? Because people deem it not important. It's quiet, Joe. Joe, just make sure there's no rocks coming up this way. This is not a condemnation. This is to get us back to where God wants us to be. I don't want a religion without God. I don't want to just go through the motions. I, I, don't, I don't want to do that. He said, seek not Bethel. He's telling them, listen, what you've made at the house of God, you've made it as a, as a place of tradition, not a place of relationship. It used to be a place where I would come and I would speak to you and you would speak to me and we'd have discourse back and forth and we'd have, you'd have revelation and, and there'd be intimacy. But you know what was going on in, in, in Bethel? Bethel became a place where they worshipped the golden calf. In their worship to God, they were using idols to worship God. Do you know that people in church today worship idols when they worship God? You say, Pastor, how, how do you know that? goes like this. I don't have to raise my hands in church. They made an idol of their opinion. I won't stand in church. I don't have to stand. They made an idol of their opinion. So they worship God the way. The Bible says, lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. That's scriptural. We don't do it just for exercise. We don't want to look at like a bunch of moose. That's not why we do it. Do you know, people, you, you, ever go, you, ever go, you ever go to a ball game? Football, baseball, whatever, right? And they do the wave? Well, if those drunken, crazy people can stand up and, woo, 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 over a ball game, then how come we can't get excited about our God? How come we can't lift our hands and praise our God? Hello, somebody. See, but the, the house of God, we, they, they worshipped idols because they didn't have the presence of God anymore. So they brought in things to distract. That's like many modern churches today. You see a lot of modern churches today, they got thousands of people. Thousands of people. He said, don't seek Bethel, nor don't enter into Gilgal. Gilgal in Hebrew means a place of separation. Hello. Hello. Don't go down there. Don't go down there. It's a false separation. It's a false holiness. It's a holiness and a righteousness only outward so people can see how righteous you are. How holy you are. How pious you are. Carrying your Bible under your arm. Look how holy I am. Don't go down to Gilgal. Don't go down to that place where they think they're separated to God doing the falsehoods that they're doing. And he says, no, go down to Bathsheba. For Gilgal shall surely go into captivity. 
and Bethel shall come to nothing. What are these churches proclaiming today? You go to some churches, man. Man, they got the lights, they got the smoke, they got all that stuff, man. They got rock style music playing, you know. They got beach balls bouncing around. And they call that worship. That's not worship. What happened at Gilgal? What happened at Gilgal? It's a place where Joshua, when he crossed the River Jordan, he crossed it over into Gilgal. It was a place where their feet first touched the promised land. And so they built stones of memorial there, of a miracle that God did for them, like he did for the Red Sea. He separated the Red Sea with Moses. He separated the Jordan River so the people could cross over. What are the people doing now? He said, don't go there. Don't keep going to the past things. Remember when God did this. Remember when God did that. Remember how great revivals were. Remember how God moved and so and so. And how God did this and so and so. He says, don't go back there. Why do you want to go back there? He says, if you're not there now, it's because somebody moved and it hasn't been me. See, revival means, and comes from, the, comes from the root word, revive. And to revive something is to bring something back to life. And Amos was trying to bring a revival to the children of Israel and Judah. He was saying, listen, I want... This is all stuff that God is telling me to tell you so that you can be revived. You can experience that revival again. You can experience the presence of God again. What else was there? The Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant represented God's presence. But even the Ark of the Covenant, listen to me now, people can can seek the presence without the presenter. If all you seek is the presence of God and not God, you're in trouble. And that's exactly what the Israelites did. They wanted that ark with them in battle because they knew it represented the presence of God. And what happened? When they took the ark of God with them and they went into a battle that God told them not to go into, the enemy defeated them, took the ark, and captured it. And they lost the presence of God. Why? Because they would not seek him and live. That's the most important. Is to seek God and live. Get life from him. Jesus said, I have come to give you life. And that life more abundantly. And that's not more houses, more cars, more fortune. That's peace and tranquility in the time of real, real hardship. When you go through the battles of life, you have this peace that goes beyond your understanding. Understand what I'm saying to you. In a span of just a few years, maybe nine years, I lost my mom, I lost my brother, and I lost my dad. In a span of maybe eight years. How did I make it? Sorrow after sorrow after sorrow. You're just getting over, kind of getting over a little bit of one. Boom, another one happens. You get over that one, and a year later, boom, that one happens. 
How you get over it is you seek the Lord. I remember people coming up to me and saying, Bob, I see God's grace all over you. Did I sorrow? Yes. Did I weep? Yes. But there was a grace that God says in time of trouble, he'll pour out his grace upon us that we'll be able to bear those things and go through those things in life. Can I get a good amen? Thank you. He said, Bethel shall come to nothing. But can I tell you what the attitude of the people were? The attitude of the people were, everything was fine. If you looked at the time during Amos' prophecy, the church was, the, 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 Israel was prospering. They had more sacrifices to God than anything else. They observed all the festivals. They did all of those things. So in the, in the eyes of everyone, they were saying, this guy is nuts. Because we're so close to God, we, we sacrifice more animals. We do more. It's not about doing. Remember Martha and Mary? When Jesus came, Martha was busy doing all the stuff. And she came and she, she complained about Mary to Jesus. She said, you know what? Here I am working my, my head off over here, and Mary's sitting at your feet. What did Jesus tell her? He said, Martha, Mary's chosen the best thing to do. Yes, all those other things needed to be done, but she knew her priorities. I'm going to sit at the feet of Jesus while Jesus is still here. I'm going to fellowship with him. But in the eyes of Israel, everything looked the opposite of what Amos was proclaiming. That's what happens when we move away from seeking God. Our hearts become so hard that we think we're right. We think we're in right relationship. We think we can get away with that kind of relationship that we have, but we cannot. You can't get away from that relationship. You can't say, well, what, what I'm doing and what I'm doing in my own relationship with God is fine. You know what you've just done? That's selfishness. You've created a God after your own selfishness. You say, I'm going to do what, God, I want, what I want to do with God, and God's going to have to accept that. That's right, sister, you tell it. Put up Revelation chapter 3. I want to read verse 1 to 6. Because you know what? There are some churches, they believe they have life. I mean, they got the full band, they got everything playing, they've got everything going. They got all the programs, they got all the basketball programs, everything for the youth. But look what he says. Unto the angel of the church of Sardis, right? These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, but you're dead. Go back. You have a name. That you are living new life. Hello. You have a name that's living. But you're dead. You've got all the outward show. But you have no substance. The people come and go as they please and they live how they please. I was talking to a pastor a few months ago, and he was telling me that in his church. There are people that come to church, lift their hands, praise the Lord, and they're living together, and they're not married. He says, I don't know what to do. He says, I preach the word, I preach the word, I preach the word. I said, you know, you need to teach them. You need to go to them. But you know what? Many pastors won't do that because you know why? Because they'll lose money. They won't tell you the truth. They won't speak the truth to you because they don't want to offend anybody. But the last time I read, the gospel is an offense. 
You don't, you don't intentionally want to offend anybody, no. I shared that with somebody uh, that was out in California. He says, I offend people. I said, you're not supposed to offend people. The message offends. And that's true. Why do we want to, we don't want to offend. But if people are living immoral lives and thinking that they can still serve God, they're under a delusion. They can live in sin and serve God. It's a delusion. It's a religion without God. <coughs> Look what it says. But be watchful, strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have found thy works perfect before God. I have not found your works perfect. Again in verse 6, seek the Lord and you shall live. Another emphasis on what to do. People ask all the time, Pastor, what do we need to do for revival? <laughs> seek the Lord and live. First thing people want to do is blame the church. Don't blame the church. Look at your life. When you stand before God, and you will, what do you have to show for your Christianity? How many people have you brought to Jesus? How many people have you told about Jesus? Oh, I see. If you do that, you won't have any friends. Oh, those won't be my friends. But let me tell you something about that. When I first became a Christian, Joe and I have been friends for over 40 years. And when I first came to Joe and I told him about Jesus, he thought I had gone to planet Pluto and back. Okay. He thought I was nuts. I know you did. Okay. He thought it was a fad. He thought I would get over it. Now, being his friend, I didn't say, well, you know what? You know, Joe and I have been friends for years, grew up, played mommy together, did all kinds of crazy stuff. I'm not going to tell him because I don't want to offend him. You know what I did? I dropped him right in the middle of a tongue-talking Pentecostal church. We walked in there. Now, he never experienced anything like this in his life. Okay? And we walked right into a Pentecostal tongue-talking church, and we sat down. And the pastor was up there and said, Okay, I want everyone, let's all just speak in tongues. And everybody started speaking in tongues. And I'm sitting there now, it, it, you, you can't see it, but I, I could see it because I was sitting next to him. His eyes were about this big. And he, I don't know if, I don't remember, but I think he said a, a, a syllable or two that may have a curse word in it. And then he said this. <coughs> Excuse me. He leaned over to me and he said, I'm getting out of here. These people are crazy. Now, I'm talking about 75 or 100 people all speaking in tongues. Okay? What does the Bible say? When a church all comes together and they all speak in tongues, if there's an unbeliever, he'll say you're crazy. He was actually fulfilling scripture and didn't even know it. Okay, and after, okay, after that, we, we didn't really see each other that much. Okay. I guess he was waiting for that fad thing to, to kind of run out, you know. But isn't it amazing? 
after 35 some odd years of praying for this man to get saved, I might just speak in tongues right now. <laughs> he got saved. Now, now, let me say this to you. For those of you who think that salvation in Jesus is only for dumb people, you know, people that are not too intelligent, okay, this man's been to Harvard. This man is very, very educated in physics and mathematics. Not just dumb people. He came to the conclusion after talking with me, and he says, you know what, Bob? He said, I asked you many questions, he said, and you answered every single one of them. And he gave his life to Jesus. And he's sitting in a Pentecostal church. No longer is he saying these people are crazy. Why? Because there's life. How did he see that life? In the church? No. He's seen it through Linda and I. Hello? And he'll be the first to tell you. Amen. Look what it says here. Verse 6. Seek ye the Lord, he who shall live, and lest you break out of like a fire in the house of Joseph and devour it. Joseph was God's favorite. Joseph was the man that had the coat of many colors. He was God's favorite. He was, Joseph, he was uh, Jacob's favorite. He says, man, lest the fire comes on the house of Joseph and devours it. And there be none to quench it. In Bethel, he's talking about destroying the very church in Bethel. Because why? Because it moved away from its purpose. It moved away from seeking God, having revelation of God, having visions of God, having dreams of God, into programs. Hello. Not getting too much response today, Brother Joe. And a lonely up here. Bathsheba was also a place of visitation. Where God showed up. And they dug a well. And they put stones as a memorial there. These special places that God had all turned away. Look at verse 7. Tell me if this does not fit the church of Jesus Christ today. Ye who turn judgment to wormwood. In other words, wormwood means in Hebrew a curse or poisonous. What do you hear mo most Christians tell you today? Don't judge. Don't you judge. You can't judge me. Don't judge. Am I telling the truth? That's all they're telling you now. Why? Because they moved away from the true meaning of what the house of God meant. I want judgment. I want God to judge me. Because I want the Holy Ghost to convict me if I'm doing something wrong. That's what a Christian's supposed to do. And when I do something and I get convicted, I thank God that He still has made me sensitive to the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. But then you've got preachers on TV telling you that God, the Holy Spirit, doesn't condemn or convict anyone of sin anymore. Joseph Prince. I'll tell you who he is. I'm not afraid. That's right, Facebook. Okay, Joseph Prince. That's who it is. He said, the Holy Spirit won't convict you of sin won't judge you. Excuse me? John, I think it's John chapter 15 says that he sent the Holy Spirit to convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Not just to speak in tongues. Hello? And it says this, look at this. You who turn, say turn. Judgment. What does that mean? In Hebrew it means... To pervert, or to overturn, or to lay aside. 
That's what they were doing. They were laying aside judgment. They were not bringing people who were sinning before God and making them accountable. Hello, I'm not talking about the one that falls in sin. I'm talking about the ones that live in sin and still think it's okay to go to House of Bethel and worship. Well, it's okay to worship in Bethel because they're worshiping through the golden calf. They're having their orgies and their sexual uh, flings and all that stuff and still go to church and still worship God in Bethel. That's what they were doing. They were having their drinking parties and, you know, their alcohol uh, uh, parties and all kinds of stuff and getting high and getting drunk and falling all over the place and having orgies and all that and still going to the house of God and worship. And they turned aside judgment. They wouldn't listen. How are we in the church today not listening? You know how I know that? Because people are going out and coming in the same as they were. Hello? I'll tell you, you can go to a ball game and you can sit way out in the bleachers. Or you can pay the price and get some really nice seats way up front. But when it comes to God's house, we come in and do everything else that we, we want to do. We play, we play church. Well, you know, I'm only here because my parents make me come here. You know, when I get 18, I'm not coming no more. That's okay. But when you die... You hear me now? When you die, you are going to stand before God. You can say, well, I don't believe that. Well, you know, that's okay. Whether you believe it or not, you go. Because either you're telling the truth or God's word is the truth, and I'll take God's word over you any day. You're going to stand before God, and he's going to play the video back. You say, all the times you had to get right with me. And you're going to plead and beg because there's going to be demon spirits wanting to rip your soul and take your soul with them. And he's going to tell you, listen, I gave you every opportunity to receive Jesus for your sin. You can't be good enough. I can't be good enough to get God's favor. Nobody can. That's why he sent Jesus Christ a man who is righteous and perfect to die on that cross for you. Oh, no, I don't want no Jesus. I don't, want no, I don't need Jesus. I, I got religion without God. And then the final gauntlet will come down on that day. And see, when he opens up the book of life and he says, your name's not in here. And I say that to all who are watching too. Some of you are backslidden. Your name's not in the book. You thought it was in the book because you believe once saved, always saved in the back of your mind, but your name is not there because your name has been erased. Revelation says that. Let's see, blots your name out of the book of life. If you can be once saved, always saved, don't have to worry about your salvation, guess what? You can't be blotted out. Then why does the word of God say you can blot your name out of the book of life? Hello? The Bible says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. See, people don't want to hear that part. So when you, when you find your name is not in the Lamb's book of life, what's going to happen? You're going to be thrown into hell with the devil and his angels in the lake of fire. Be tormented for eternity. Forever and ever. But that's your choice. Well, you know, I want to go to hell where all my friends are. <laughs> well, let me tell you, if you have any friends in hell, they could talk to you. They'll tell you, don't come here. Enjoying this? He said, you turn it to wormwood, and you leave off righteousness in the earth. You're not doing what's right. There are other things in the world that are more important to you there's more things that you do in the world than you do in the church, or you do it in Christ. Come on. Well, I, I, hear, I hear this all the time. People tell me, well, Pastor, you know, I don't like to read. I, never, I was never a reader. I said, you liar. You get on that Internet, 
and you read page after page after page after page after page for hour upon hour, don't tell me you don't like to read. You don't want to read God's word because it's like a fire and it's like a mirror and it will reflect on who you are. That's why you don't like to read God's word. Hello? I can hear no crickets. Verse 10. Drop down to verse 10. They hate him that rebuketh in the gate, and they abhor him that speaketh uprightly. Put the uh, N N NLT on that one for me. How you hate honest judges. How you despise people who tell the truth. What does the Bible say? We're living in that day. In the last days, men shall have their ears, shall turn away from the truth, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Why? Because they want to have their ears tickled. They only want to hear what they want to hear. They want to hear soft things, pleasant things, nice things. And it's good to hear nice things when things are going right. But when God begins to speak, it's because he's challenging your heart. And he's telling you, listen to me. I know what's best for you. I love you. I'm giving you the roadmap to success in your life. That doesn't mean you're not going to have failures. Some of the best, famous, richest men in the world were failures. You're always going to have something to fail at, but you're always going to pick yourself up. You're going to be of that spirit and say, you know what? I may have failed. That's, and failure is only this. Failure only teaches you what not to do and again. Oh, I have so much here. There were four things that they went through. In verse 18, you're going to see this in verse 18. Verse 15, he says this, Hate the evil and love the good and establish judgment in the gate. It's time to bring back judgment in the gate. Doesn't the Bible say judgment will begin in the house of God? Well, if it says that, who's going to bring the judgment? got to be the leaders but we got we got wishy-washy leaders today we got leaders that don't want to tell the truth because they don't want to offend people and they don't want to lose their income so they can have their big ministries but I'm going to prophesy right now I'm going to tell you what's going to happen you watch what I'm telling you these big ministries when the rubber hits the road they ain't going to last because when it costs them something and it will cost them something They'll run for the hills because they have no substance. Think of it. Think about it. If, if you came to a church that when you walked in and they said to you, you know what? You can believe whatever you want to believe. Doesn't matter your eschatology. Doesn't matter, you know, what your theology, whatever you want to believe. As long as you believe Jesus is your Lord and Savior, that's all that matters. You can believe whatever you want. Can I tell you, that's what Constantine did in Rome when he brought all of Christianity into the government as a government church. And he brought it all under them and said, doesn't matter, you can bring your paganism, bring it, yeah, go ahead, bring your pagan stuff, yep, go ahead, yep, go ahead, bring it all in, it doesn't matter, it's under the guise of Christian, we all love God, and, you know, we're all part of it. And that's why you have the, the, the churches today that are welcoming homosexuality and lesbianism into their church. And you're having lesbian and, pa and, lesbian and homosexual pastors <clears throat> and if you don't agree with them, guess what? You're homophobic. You're this phobic. You're deplorable. You're this or you're that. That's not true. Where's justice? Where's truth? Where's the judges to judge and, to, and put things in order? We have judges that are in the, in the court system that are doing the same thing. I read in the paper the other day, somebody got arrested for burglary. Okay? This is the sixth time, I believe it was, six times. Okay? He let him go on his own recognizance. 
Oh, but I wonder how he'd feel if somebody broke into his house. Okay? And stole his stuff. It'd be a little different. It's called partial judgment. Partiality. We're not judging anything anymore. We're living on a, under a banner of tolerance. And that tolerance, listen to me right now, that tolerance is going to destroy this nation. You hear me? I mean, you can believe whatever you want to. You can believe a monkey eating a peanut is your God if you want to. Okay? You can believe the canary you have in your cage is your God. You can believe whatever you want to. I, I'm not here to tell you what to believe. But I'm here to tell you that that's not, that's not the true God. And believing in a canary or in a monkey who eats peanuts will get you to heaven is a lie. But don't you understand, that's what we've done in our own conscience, in our own mind, when we made up a God who we want to like, who we accept. We accept a God that we create in our own mind. That's idolatry. You know, we come against the, the Roman Catholics with their big statues and everything. Guess what? There are many Protestants today that have many, many bigger statues in their brains. It's called their opinions. They worship those opinions more so than the Catholics worship their gods. Sorry, I'm telling you the truth. Look what God says in verse uh, 18. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. Wait a minute, I thought we all want, the, we all want God to come back, right? No. We want the Lord to come back and be right. See, these people thought they were right, and they were saying, we want the day of the Lord, we want the day of the Lord. Can't wait for God to come back. You know, you ain't right. Look what it says. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness, not light. When it says darkness, that means God's bringing judgment. I said it before. God's word says that judgment will be, it not might, Judgment will begin in the house of the Lord. It's going to happen. It is beginning to happen because I'm believing God is raising up voices like mine to speak the truth, to speak and have judgment in the house of God and saying, no, this is not right. This is not acceptable. That's not right. That's not acceptable. And if you don't like it, I don't mean to offend you, but that's the way it is. I'm not going back to that church again. Good. You'll contaminate it. The Bible says a little leaven leavens the whole lump. If I was to allow someone to live together as a couple, to come to church, to lift their hands, to praise God, and give the impression that the pastor is all for that kind of a relationship out of marriage, you know what would happen? This whole place would be filled with fornicators. If I gave the impression, and believe me, there are some pastors that preach behind the pulpit drunk. Hello? There are some pastors that preach behind this pulpit and they're homosexuals secretly. Hello? But if I allowed that and said to everybody, oh yeah, it's fine to drink alcohol, go ahead. Drink as much as you want. Go ahead. Have fun. You know what? The whole place will be full of alcoholics. We'd all be singing songs like Kiss the Blonde Stone on St. Patrick's Day rather than worship songs. Hello? Look what he says here. Now, verse 21, when you put verse 21, would you put the Message Bible up there? Because that speaks right to it. Now, I want you to understand, I'm not rebuking anybody here. Please, please understand that. I'm not rebuking anybody in this congregation or anybody on Facebook. But if you are not living right, you know what they say, if the shoe fits, it, <clears throat> wear it. If it's not, well, that's fine. But look what it says here. This is God saying this. <coughs> Excuse me. 
How do you like our new mic, by the way? Isn't it nice? It doesn't drop. doesn't do any of those dumb things that we were doing before. Here's God saying to the church, oh, yes, I just love your assembly. I just love hearing your praises. I just love it when you all get together and just look at all like a big family, all just clapping and just worshiping God. What's he say? Can't stand your religious meetings. I'm fed up with your conventions and your conferences. Why? Because they replaced the conferences and the conventions and the religious meetings for him. I don't care how many times you go to church. I don't, I don't care how much lingo you know, Christian lingo. Hello. Next verse. This is God speaking. I want nothing to do with your religion projects. Your pretentious slogans and goals. Look at this. I'm sick of your fundraising schemes. Just turn the television set on. You think I'm lying? If you just send us a thousand dollars, God will bless you. Just sow your seed. I say, go soak your head. You're gonna be crazy to do that. Well, you know, if if God, if you sow a seed of a thousand dollars, God will bless you with a thousand, a hundredfold blessing. You know, I, I want to challenge you. If that's true, you call up that ministry. Okay? And you say, now, if I, sow, if I put $1,000 in it, you're, telling, you're saying that God will give me a hundredfold blessing? That means a hundred times more back. And if they say, oh, yeah, God, praise God, you want to sow $1,000 and get a hundredfold blessing back? Say, no, I, I was going to ask you to send me $1,000 so you can get the hundredfold blessing. Hello? 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 Are you there? That's what's going to happen. They'll hang up on you. They'll think you're a smart aleck. But it's the truth. If, why wouldn't they, right? They're trying to raise money, right? If they're trying to raise money and they really believe you're going to get a hundredfold blessing, then why don't they send you the $1,000 and they'll get the hundredfold blessing? They'll have more. Ah, you know why? Because it's what's called a marketing concept scheme. He says, I'm sick of your fundraising schemes. You think God is pleased? You think God's pleased that we waste more money and more time on television talking about money and prosperity while thousands and thousands of people are dying and going to hell without Christ? He's sick of your television telethons and schemes. Your public relations and your image making. I'm with President Trump. See, he's, we're we're right. You know, we have access to the president. You know, we're we're we're, we're the ones. No, give me a little old Amos Fama. Give me a little nobody like myself. A little nobody. Give me a little nobody, but give me the voice of God. Let me thunder the truth of God. Let me speak the truth in love. Hallelujah. Look, up, look, look what else he says. Look, 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 look. Next. I've had all I can take of your noisy ego. Music. What the heck is that? What's ego music? Every musician up there, not for the glory of God, but to proclaim and profess their talent. Look at me. Look how I can play. Look how I can play the drum. Look at how I can play the guitar. 
Look at me. Look at my talents. Oh, they're so wonderful. Oh, they, the group's so beautiful. Oh. He says, I've had all I can take of your noisy ego music. And then he says this, when is the last time you sang to me? Seek ye me and live. When's the last time you sang these songs to God? And not just to sing to be seen by somebody so they could say, oh, look, you know, so-and-so stood up and so-and-so raised their hands and so-and-so praised. Isn't that wonderful? When's the last time God's saying to you, when's the last time you sang to me? Why is the worship team up here? It's a worship team. What do they do? You see the girls, they were up here. And one of the guys sometimes comes up here. Why, why do they come up there? Why do they stand there? Why do they sing? Is it just to fill in the slot for the time frame? No. Because they're worshiping God. And I've told us to the worship team, if God begins to touch you, don't worry. Put the microphone down. Get on your knees. Get on your face. Whatever you have to do. Whatever God is speaking to you at that time. If God gives you a word to speak, speak the word. Come on, somebody. I'm running out of time. Next verse. Do you know what I want? Do you know what God wants? Do you know what God wants? Come on. Can I have a response? Do you know what God wants? Everybody's like numb. Oh my God, this is heavy stuff. <laughs> what was that? Yeah, he wants justice. Oceans of it. He wants fairness. Rivers of it. That's what I want. That's all I want. In fact, Martin Luther King said that very verse in Amos. That he wants justice. He wants oceans of it. Fairness, rivers of it. What's fair? Well, I can't believe it. What's, what's the matter? What's the problem? Well, I, 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 I you know, was looking for work, and, and, and this guy... They gave him $10 an hour, and they only gave me 8 That's not fair. We're, we're both doing the same job, and it's not fair. Well, what did Jesus say when you enter into an agreement? Did you agree for the $8? Yeah? Well, then shut up. Hello? Did you agree with the $10? Yeah. Well, then shut up. Why are you, why are you so envious about the other person is it, can't the, 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 the man that's giving out or paying the bills give, be generous to who he wants to? If you agree to... That's, there's a story like that in the Bible, by the way. Jesus talks about that. You agreed with a penny? And, and then the last guy that came in the, for the hour, one hour, he got the same pay as everybody that worked all day? Oh, man, that really ruffles some feathers. Man, Jesus, that ain't fair! I, brought, I, I burned, you know, I, I, I went out in the sun all day, in that hot sun for all day for a penny, and, and, and this guy came in for the last hour, and you paid him the same thing as me? And Jesus said, did I defraud you? When I asked you to work, did, did you agree to the price? Yeah, then go your way, you got your money. Can I be generous with what I want to be generous with? See, man's hearts are evil. What is it that God is saying? What is God saying? Put up uh, Amos, and I'm going to close with this. Amos 7, verse 10. Amos 10, uh, 7, verse 10. <clears throat> Now, here's what happens. Watch this. I might get some flack from this, but that's okay. Amaziah, the priest at the shrine at Bethel, said a message to Ber Jeroboam, king of Israel. Amos is plotting to get rid of you. And he's doing it as an insider working from within Israel. His talk will destroy the country. 
He's got to be silenced. Do you know what Amos is saying? Now go to verse 12 and 13. Then Amaziah confronted Amos. He said, see a prophet. Be on your way. Get out of here and go back to Judah where you came from. In other words, I don't want to hear what God has to say. You don't know something? That's what a lot of churches today are doing. They don't want to hear what God has to say. They want to go to a church that makes them feel good. They want to go to a church that encourages and lifts them up. These are the millennials of today. You can't even tell them anything without them getting their feelings hurt. If you tell them something, they say, oh, 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 I got to go home. I need a sick day. Oh, all I did was tell them to pick up their pants. Oh, oh, I need a sick day. Oh, I can't handle this stress. I can't handle this rejection. My God. At 18, back in the 40s, we had 18-year-olds running on the beaches to Normandy with, with rifles shooting at the enemy. You got 18-year-old kids today that can't take a, a test in college because Trump got elected. Give me a break. We don't have men anymore. We have wimps. Do you have religion without God? That's a good question. It's not rhetorical. You don't have to answer me. But why are you saying this, Pastor? Why are you bringing this message? Because I believe this with all of my heart. Listen to me. God is about to break out a revival like you have not seen. But it's going to do two things. It's going to burn to catch on fire, and it's going to burn to consume. It's going to burn so people will get more on fire for him, or it's going to consume people so much that they're going to run out of the church and not come back anymore. They're going to say, like the people of Israel, I can't take God no more. Prophet, go, go, go back home. Go somewhere else. We don't need you anymore. But I'm of the... I'm of the tribe that says, come Lord Jesus. Lord, shake and bake me. Hallelujah. If you've got to turn me upside down, God, if you've got to search my heart and see if there be any wicked way in me, go ahead and do it. Because you know what, God? I want all of you. I want all of that you have for me. I want all that you have for New Bedford. I want all for those who attend this church. God, I pray, God, from the crown of their heads to the soles of their feet, God, that you would speak a word, a rhema word that will catch them on fire, that will begin to pray for revival for this city, for this nation, for this church, and that God would wake up the people in these churches that are playing church. Church, going to church isn't to break uh, stick lights and pass around balls in worship. Church isn't for you to come and see all the fancy purple, pink and white lights and black altar church is for you to come and hear God's word and walk out challenged walk out stirred I'm going to serve God hallelujah we may not be the biggest church we may not be the most popular church but one thing is my, nobody will be looking for me saying you never told me the truth they'll never blame me and say pastor you, you, at least you had guts to speak the truth to me so that I could line up with God's word. Now, it's up to you. It's not up to me whether you respond or not. Amen? So ask yourself the question, do I have religion without God? Let's bow our heads. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that I was able to convey this message to the best of my ability. I know there was a lot more notes I wanted to do, and I got off of them, Lord. But I pray, God, that you will use your servant's words.